An abbreviated summary of the book of Joshua. After the death of Moses, God calls on Joshua to lead the Israelites across the Jordan River and take possession of the Promised Land. God guarantees victory in the military campaign and vows never to leave the Israelites so long as they obey his laws. The people swear their allegiance to Joshua. The Israelites cross the Jordan River, led by a team of 12 priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant. As the priests enter the water, the flow of the river stops and the Israelites cross the river on dry land. Arriving on the other side, the Israelites commemorate the miracle with an altar of 12 stones from the riverbed, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The people begin to eat the produce of the new land, thus halting the daily 40-year supply of manna. Following divine instruction, Joshua leads the Israelites in carrying the ark around Jericho for six days. On the seventh day, the Israelites march around the city seven times. After the sound of the ram's horn, followed the shout of the people, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, and the Israelites destroyed the city and its inhabitants. They are wonderful. A history of Morton Gould. Morton Gould was an American composer, conductor, and pianist born in New York on December 10, 1913, and passed on February 21, 1996 in Orlando, Florida. 
As a four-year-old, Gould demonstrated tremendous musical talent by performing from ear on the piano, and a mere two years later, composed his first work titled Just Six, a waltz for piano. As an eight-year-old, Gould earned a scholarship and entered New York's Institute of Musical Art, later becoming, in 1926, Juilliard School of Music. His principal teacher for music theory and composition was Vincent Jones, and piano was Abby Whiteside. As a teenager, Gould gave piano recitals in and around New York, often improvising on themes and phrases, contributed by the audience, a skill he continued throughout his life. Gould, at the age of 21, was on staff at Radio City Music Hall when it opened in 1932. He conducted, arranged, and composed for the weekly program Music for Today on WOR New York, a radio station that's still on today. Through network radio, he attained national recognition as well as the discipline's skill set to compose on a deadline and the imaginative habit of creating titles for movements rather than just tempo indications. Gould's oldest daughter, Abby G. Burton, provided me with the following insights of her father. In the 1940s, it was suggested that Daddy write for band, for which he replied, why do I want to write for band? I'm having enough problems with the professional orchestras. Why should I have to deal with the music for kids? But the general manager of Mills Music, Mark Stark, convinced me to write a work and try it out with the University of Michigan Band under the direction of Dr. William Ravelli. Dr. Ravelli said he would love to have me as a guest conductor to do part of a concert and introduce my Cowboy Overture of 1941. I remember saying to Stark, Mac, why am I doing this? And he said, you're going to be surprised, very surprised. Daddy did go to Michigan and attend that concert. He was blown away by the rich, multi-layered sound Dr. Ravelli got out of those student band members. After this experience, Gould was hooked. Writing for school and military bands became his lifelong passion. Daddy often traveled to universities as a guest teacher and conductor. He also delighted in visits to military bands as well. In short order, military and student musicians and their directors became his favorite colleagues. Gould was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Music in 1995 for his composition, String Music, which was commissioned by the National Symphony Orchestra. In 2005, he was honored posthumously with the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. Gould's original manuscripts, personal papers, and other relevant works are archived in the Library of Congress. Background of Jericho, Rhapsody for Symphonic Band. In the late 1930s, Gould chose the embattled city as the subject of one of the first major works written for concert bands. Original works for band were uncommon then, and bands relied heavily on transcriptions. While Jericho Rhapsody was difficult for high school and university bands alike, it was hailed as an essential addition to the thin repertoire. 25-year-old Gould wrote Jericho Rhapsody for the Pennsylvania School Music Association at the request of George Howard, who was then on faculty of Mansfield State Teachers College. Gould wrote the work in either 1938 or 1939 and regrets that he did not date his compositions during that period. The work premiered in 1941. In his January 1995 article for the Instrumentalist magazine, Arnold D. Gabriel asked Gould about his preparations before writing Jericho Rhapsody, to which Gould replied, all I did was read the book of Joshua. <clears throat> Abby offers this story of one of her daddy's performances. Abby and her sister, Deborah, took her three-year-old son, Jeremy, to hear his papa conduct a college band. The three of us sat in the back of the room while daddy went through a few pieces. Then came Jericho. Up until then, Jeremy was thoroughly enjoying watching Papa duct the band. But then came the whole wall falling down part. The entire percussion section did their thing very loudly. Jeremy got really frightened and began crying. As he crawled up onto my lap, he wailed, why is Papa carrying me? Deborah and I quickly rushed the hysterical child out of the room as Daddy had the band stop playing. 
As we passed a now very quiet group of musicians and their conductor on the way out the door, Daddy turned to his student performers and said, everyone's a critic. <laughs> Jericho Analysis. Jericho is a rhapsody for symphonic band, as its title implies. A rhapsody in music is a one-movement work that is episodic and yet integrated, free-flowing in structure, featuring a range of highly contrasted moods, color, and tonality. A rhapsody's impulsive inspiration and a touch of improvisation make it freer in form than a set of variations. In addition, Jericho could be considered program music. Program music is instrumental music that carries some extra musical meaning, some program of a literary idea, legend, scenic depiction, or personal drama. Program music contrasts with absolute or abstract music in which artistic interest confines to theoretical constructions in sound. Gould structured the composition of Jericho into the following episodes. I will read the scripture from the Bible, and then the ensemble will perform some of the music. Listen carefully to the words of the scripture and allow your imagination to then explore the musical communication directly from Gould's creative compositional mind as the band performs it. A brief listening suggestion will follow the reading of the scripture. You may also follow along your Jericho lecture recital notes printed for you at the back of the room. Episode one, prologue. Joshua one, verses one through nine. Musical measures one through four. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Listening suggestion. The woodwind consort is performing octave unisons in pitch combined with challenging rhythm. These octaves are strong and courageous and supported by the brass in a portent statement foreshadowing what is to come later in the piece. Episode two, roll call. Joshua three, verses 12, musical measures 27 through 30. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. Listening suggestion. These three bars of 4-4 time signature equate to 12 total beats, just as the 12 men from the tribes of Israel. Perhaps Gould is using the separate bell tone attacks of the trumpets to signify each of the men as they step forward to answer the call of God. Episode three, chant. Joshua three, verses five. Musical measures 63 through 69. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Listening suggestion. Gould asked the musicians to perform with a relaxed and a lyrical and warm sound. Listen as the ensemble works together in musical worship through orchestrated performance.
Episode four, dance. Joshua five, verses 10 through 12, musical measures 92 through 99. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes, and parched grain. Listening suggestion. The Israelites had been eating manna, which is wafer-like crackers with honey. When they finally crossed into the promised land, after wandering for 40 years, 40 years of little crackers, and can enjoy the abundance of nourishment it provides, you can imagine the eating, dancing, and festive atmosphere surrounding the Israelites. Listen to the rhythm Gould uses and how it ignites a feeling of dancing and interaction between the winds and percussion. Episode 5, March and Battle. Joshua 6, verse 7, musical measures 171 to 195. And he said to the people, go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. Listening example. The snare drum begins this phrase at a pianissimo dynamic level, designed to sound off in the distance. The winds enter on the same dynamic and slowly get louder, creating a Doppler effect as the marching Israelites march closer and closer. Listen for the musical signal bugle calls from various instruments, which were a form of communicating before electronics. I know you want to hear more of that. It's coming. Episode 6. Shouts of Israelites and the walls come tumbling down. Joshua 6, verse 5. Musical measures 237 and 239. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. Listening suggestion. You will have to wait for the full performance to hear Gould's use of trumpet to signal the shout of the Israelites, the moment I am sure you are all eagerly waiting. Make sure to listen for it. In order to symbolize the shout of the Israelite people, Gould creatively asked the wind performers to flutter tongue. Flutter tonguing is a wind instrument tonguing technique in which performers flutter their tongue to make a characteristic <laughs> sound followed by the percussion section demonstrating the fall of the walls of Jericho.
Episode 7, hallelujah. Joshua 23, verse 14, and Joshua 24, 16 through 18. Musical measures 254 to 261. And now I am about to go the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you, not one of them has failed. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our, your, our God who brought us and our fathers up in the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Listening example. In essence, part of the book of Joshua is about God's promise coming to fruition. This section should sound thankful, rejoiceful, and moving as the people now truly understand that God does provide even in mysterious ways. And now the full performance of Morton Gould's Jericho Rhapsody for Symphonic Band, 1941.
What you just heard was Carol of the Russian Children, a critical mass performance. Thank you guys again. Alfred Reed was an American composer and conductor. However, was born Alfred Friedman in New York on January 25th, 1921, and passed on September 17th, 2005 in Coral Gables, Florida. During World War I, Reed's father, Austrian Karl Friedman von Mark, who Reed credits his healthy musical upbringing by the con constant playing of great classical works on the family's gramophone, changed the family name to Friedman due to the increasing anti-German sentiment and for the safety of his family. By the age of 10, Reed was studying trumpet and performed professionally during high school. Alfred Friedman held the surname until he was 13 years of age when his talent booking agent for trumpet suggested a shorter name would be easier to remember and easier to spell. The agent took one syllable from Friedman and created Reed, to which Alfred Reed adopted in all professional circles of New York. After composing music for an upcoming performance with one of his performing groups, Reed became hooked with composition and decided writing would be his passion. At the age of 15, Reed studied music theory and harmony with John P. Sacco, who, according to Reed, was the first director of the first musical dinner theater in the country, the Paper Mill Playhouse in New Jersey, and Paul Yarton, who was not only a technician, but a writer and who was actively working in the composition profession. Yarton was educated at the Vienna and Paris conservatories, where he studied piano with Joseph Hoffman and composition with Camille Saint-Saëns. These relationships led to a position as a staff composer, arranger, and assistant conductor for the radio workshop in New York. The National Youth Administration Radio Workshop was an agency set up by President Franklin D. Roosevelt to assist in bringing the United States out of the Great Depression. And the radio workshop was housed in the Ed Sullivan Building on Broadway. Young individuals could work 60 hours a month for $22 to gain work experience that would facilitate them finding jobs in the future. Reed used his position with the radio workshop to observe as many rehearsals as possible, including those under the direction of Leopold Stokowski, Fritz Mahler, Morton Gould, and many more. During World War II, when it became evident that Reed would be drafted into the service, Reed enlisted and was away from New York City for three and a half years. Reed served as associate conductor of the 529th U.S. Air Force Band and then attended Juilliard School of Music from 1946 to 1948. One of his instructors being neo-romantic American composer of operas, songs, symphonies, and band works, Vittorio Giannini. While in the Army, Reed had the opportunity to hear a performance of every piece that he wrote almost immediately by professional performers. In an interview, Reed states, I must say those 39 months I spent where, what shall I say, the years when I really began to learn my craft, the way to do things quickly, efficiently, and accurately so that the first time it was played through everybody, including myself, could get a good idea of what was going on in the music. Most of Reed's time in the military was spent composing and arranging music for weekly radio broadcasts and public concerts. I did over 150 works in those 39 months, including arrangements of the entire Beethoven Symphony No. 9 and two hours of music from Handel's Messiah, where we would use a Hammond organ for the string accompaniments for the solo voices. Most of his works were arrangements for radio broadcast, concerts carried on KOA, KLZ, nationally, and WFPG and KMYR in the Atlantic City and Denver areas. In 1948, he took a post as a staff composer and arranger for NBC and later held the same position at ABC radio program. Reed then became the conductor of the Baylor University String Orchestra in 1953 and earned his Bachelor of Music in 1955 and Masters of Music in 1956 from Baylor University. From 1966 until 1993, Reed taught theory, composition, music marketing, and music education at the University of Miami, where he also conducted the wind ensemble. Reed has over 250 works for band, orchestra, chorus, and chamber ensemble, and his compositional style described as melodic and post-romantic. Russian Christmas music. 
Russian Christmas music is an original composition by Alfred Reed, composed and premiered on December 12, 1944, as a part of a nationwide broadcast on the NBC radio network. The concert premiere was on December 14, 1944, in the Denver City Auditorium. This place would later be known as the Catholic this piece would later be known as a Catholic composition igniting the rest of Reed's career and brought his name to the forefront of the school wind band movement. A path that, like Morton Gould, Reed had never intended or entertained the thought of pursuing. In the late summer of 1944, the Allied forces have successfully invaded France and Belgium, and the consensus was that World War II would soon come to a victorious end. In Denver, during that same summer, the war bond effort, war bonds are debt securities issued by the government to finance military operations and other expenditures in times of war, had gone very well and a free concert was planned to thank the citizens of Denver for their support. Roy Harris, a prominent American composer and teacher, assembled a band of the best performers from each of the five military ensembles in the Denver area. The commanding officers of each of these groups promised him complete cooperation and Alfred Reed was requested to de be detached from his regular military duties to help with the administrative work of this performance. Plans for the de mid-December concert were going very well until late November when a problem arose. At the time, Russia, was Amer Russia and America were great allies and therefore the program was initially designed as a Russian-American tribute to help introduce Russian culture to America. The concert would include a premiere of a new Russian work as well as a new American work. The American work was to be a transcription of the second movement of Harris' Sixth Symphony, which he retitled Abraham Lincoln Symphony for band. The Russian piece was to be Prokofiev's March, Opus 99, which Harris, however, found had already been premiered earlier in the United States. Harris had the problem of finding another never-before-performed Russian work that could be presented as a part of the advertised program. Keep in mind, this is pre-Google, pre-Internet. Reed recalls, Harris said the best thing that he had been able to come up with is that I should write a new Russian work for the occasion, and with that, he hung up the phone. I sat there thinking that it was just 15 or 16 days before the concert, and I could not believe what I heard, so I dialed him back and said, Roy, this is Alfred again. Did I hear you correctly? You want me to write a new Russian work for this concert? He said, don't worry, I have every confidence in you. I said, Ray, the concert is 15 or 16 days away. He said, well, just don't make it too long, only about 14 or 15 minutes. And with that, he hung up the phone again. Reed began his research into Russian music at the military's base's music library. Reed found a traditional Russian vocal piece titled Carol of the Little Russian Children. You heard this piece performed by the critical mass performers moments ago. Reed opened a copy of the Yellow Pages, a telephone directory or a section of one printed on yellow paper, listing businesses and other organizations according to the goods or services they offer, an archaic form of Google. I'm saying that for these guys. <clears throat> and contacted the Eastern Orthodox Church from Globeville, Colorado, a suburb north of Denver. Reed met with one of the pastors of the church who provided him with musical examples used in Eastern Orthodox service. The Eastern Orthodox Church does not admit any instrumental music in its worship service on the premise that one worships God with only natural means of expression and not by the aid of any mechanical device. Reed decided not to use these musical examples because the number of changes needed to convert from vocal to instrumental would not allow the integrity of the vocal music to be retained. In Russian Christmas music, Reed created original melodies and combined them with the Carol of the Little Russian Children, which was the only authentic Russian melody in the composition. Reed was granted permission to remain at home to work on the composition. Each day, Reed's wife, Marjorie, would bring the completed parts of the arrangement to the base where a special team of five copyists were ready to help complete this project. Russian Christmas music was completed in 11 days, with the copyists taking an additional two days to finish the parts before rehearsal began. Russian Christmas music is a single continuous movement divided into four distinct sections. Here are the four distinct sections. 
Section one, Carol of the Little Russian Children, Musical Measures one through 13. The first section was entitled Children's Carol. Listen as the bell chimes call the faithful to worship and signal the start of service performed over the pedal D on the tuba. The carol of the Little Russian Children melody ensues within the rich and dark shalomo register of the clarinet voice, supported tonight by the saxophones. Section two, antiphonal chant, musical measures 32 to 42. Now listen to the second section entitled antiphonal chant. Here our priest offers the word of God and the congregation repeats the words during worship. Section three, musical measures 118 to 126. The third section entitled Village Song is a beautiful melody that ebbs and flows through prescribed dynamic contrast. Reed orchestrates the string bass as accompaniment in this section. However, tonight, the string bass part will be performed on the marimba. Section four, musical measures 166 to 171. The final section called Cathedral Chorus is a musically robust section that begins with percussion over a D pedal. The low brass enters and what follows is genuinely an exciting end to Russian Christmas music.
And now the moment you've all been waiting for, the performance of Alfred Reed's Russian Christmas music, 1944.
All right, we will only be here about three more hours. We've got more stuff. Just joking. That uh, concludes our concert. Um, we do have refreshments in the back. Um, thank you, thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for supporting Grand Canyon University. <laughs>